So at this point, after you've studied the supply and demand model, production possibilities curves, and consumer and producer surplus, all these ideas come together, you can start to grasp one of the main big ideas from economics. And this is when you look at a competitive market, the intersection of supply and demand, where we find that equilibrium price, the one price where the quantity people want to buy is equal to the quantity people want to sell, that equilibrium quantity, if that's the amount we produce of that particular good, then we can show that this is an efficient outcome. Now exactly what do we mean when we say efficient outcome and how can we show this? It's actually a little bit of a complicated thing to prove, but we want to make sure that you have a good grasp intuitively of why this makes sense. So remember that when we're making this argument, we're assuming that A, we're operating in a competitive environment. Perfect competition means there are a lot of little buyers and sellers out there all producing, consuming the same thing, and that all markets are competitive markets. So there are no monopolies. The other thing we're assuming here in the background is that the demand curve completely represents the total benefits. That means that there are no externalities, no positive externalities, no negative externalities associated with this good. And the supply curve represents the complete marginal cost of production. So we're assuming that when this good is being produced, that there is no pollution out there that is not being handled, not being paid for to take care of this pollution by the producer. So if this is true, that equilibrium quantity is efficient. And when we say efficient, we mean two kinds of efficiency. Let me remind you of these two ideas of efficiency by looking at a production possibilities frontier. Sometimes you'll call this a production possibilities curve. And if we boil down all of the different kinds of goods and services in an economy into two categories, say consumer goods versus military goods. And this blue line represents the highest possible amounts, highest possible combinations of these two goods that an economy could produce. And when we say highest possible combination, we mean that all of our resources are being used. There's no unemployment. People are working in the right jobs where they have the best comparative advantage, etc. Then two kinds of efficiency we want to talk about. First, if we're anywhere along this blue curve, we call that productive efficiency. Productive efficiency, by definition of what we're looking at on this production possibilities curve or production possibilities frontier, just means that we're producing as much as we can. So using the resources we have, we are producing as much as we can. Any of these points, whether it's 16 units of consumer goods and no military goods, that's one possible point here, right there. Or we could be right here, where we're at seven units of military goods and 13 units of consumer goods. Or down here, anywhere along this production possibilities frontier is productively efficient. The other kind of efficiency we want to think about is called allocative efficiency. And allocative efficiency, when we're looking at a production possibilities frontier model, asks, are we producing the right combination of military goods and consumer goods? There are an infinite number of combinations as we go along this production possibilities frontier. Which is the one that will maximize the utility, the success, the happiness, whatever our goal is, what is the one point out of all these that would be the one that creates the most satisfaction, the most utility? Well, which of these points along here that we're gonna to wanna to be at, if we're thinking about this in terms of production possibilities, would depend on the circumstances. In a society, do we want to have mostly consumer goods like this point over here, A? Or do we want to have all military goods like this point down here, B? Well, it just depends. Now, if we were living in a time of perfect peace 
and we were living in a country where there was no possibility of any kind of invasion, we had no enemies at all, then of course I would want to be over here at point A. Spending money on military goods when there's no use for them would obviously be a waste or inefficient. So maybe point A would be better if we were in a time of total peace. However, if we were in a time where your country has just been attacked and invasion is imminent, then maybe we don't want to be exactly down at point B, but maybe something closer to C. We really want to produce an extreme amount of military goods, but maybe produce just enough consumer goods like food and healthcare and education to keep us to where we can survive. So allocative efficiency. Are we allocating our productive resources in a way to produce the right kinds of things, the kinds of things that we value the most? Now again, if we're in a competitive market, here's how we can justify this conclusion that that equilibrium quantity, and here we're thinking across all goods and all services. If we're producing the equilibrium quantity of medical visits and bread and cars and gasoline across all markets and critically we're assuming that all markets are competitive, probably not true in most countries, and the demand and supply curves do perfectly represent willingness to pay and willingness to accept marginal cost and marginal benefit, then we can make this argument that we know productive efficiency is being achieved because production costs are going to be minimized at each quantity of output. That is an equilibrium quantity. Now you're going to see a little bit more details to fill in this argument when you study perfect competition and cost curves in the long run. So be looking out for that piece whenever you study production decisions in the perfect competition model. We can make this argument that allocative efficiency is achieved at this equilibrium quantity of output because of three things being true about that equilibrium quantity. First, marginal benefit equals marginal cost. So when we're graphing supply and demand, remember that each point on the demand curve tells us the marginal benefit which is how much people are willing to pay for each additional unit. That supply curve represents the true marginal cost of each unit as it's produced. B, that's also going to be where the maximum willingness to pay as reflected by those points on the demand curve equal the minimum acceptable price. Again, this part B is true because we're assuming that there aren't any externalities, there aren't any public goods, or other problems that might arise. And later on in your micro course, you should be looking at some examples of things that have positive externalities, negative externalities, and some of these other market failures. Here we're assuming no market failures, so the market gives us a good outcome. And C, the combination of producer and consumer surplus is going to be maximized. Again, that surplus triangle here at that equilibrium quantity, Q, is going to be as big as it can be, divided into consumer surplus on the top and producer surplus on the bottom. This big idea that under certain assumptions markets are efficient is sometimes a hard idea to fully digest, and it's also an idea that is criticized by many people. But make sure you understand that those criticisms are valid when these assumptions are not actually true. And as economists, we realize that these assumptions, that we're operating in a perfectly competitive market for all goods and all services, probably isn't true. And that the demand curve probably doesn't completely represent total benefits and the supply curve probably doesn't completely measure the marginal costs in all markets all the time. The reason why we start with these simplifying assumptions is that if all these things are true, then we get this efficient outcome. Some of the things we'll study later on in this semester 
are breaking down those cases when things are not perfectly efficient. And so make sure you pay attention to those cases. We're not saying that everything is efficient all the time and that economists love markets without reservation. There are things we call market failures where the government needs to get involved.